Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds and the 2023 Alan M. Boyden Memorial Lectureship, hosted by the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics. I'm Kevin Dirksen, Senior Director at the Center and the Andy and Bev Hansel Endowed Chair in Applied Healthcare Ethics. We're broadcasting live from Providence St. Vincent Medical Center on Teams Live. You can earn CME credit for watching either live or a recording of this event, which is available by the same link as the invite for today's presentation. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the presentation, so please do submit your questions and we'll hold them to the end as time permits. For those of you who don't know Dr. Boyden, he was a well-respected leader in local and national arenas who was a surgeon at Providence St. Vincent Center Medical Center for nearly 50 years. One of his greatest attributes as a physician and surgeon was an ability to find wholeness in the doctor-patient relationship. This lectureship promotes excellence in patient care by connecting medicine and healthcare with the humanities. It is made possible by the generous contributions of our supporters through the Providence St. Vincent Medical Foundation. And now it is my privilege to introduce our 2023 Alan M. Boyden Memorial Lectureship Speaker, Catherine Brown Saltzman. Catherine has spent her career in service to others. She graduated from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing before graduate school completing a Master of Arts from Lesley College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She began her career as an oncology nurse and then worked in hospice settings before beginning her storied career at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. At UCLA, Catherine co-chaired one of the most recognizable and impactful ethics committees in the United States before co-founding the UCLA Health Ethics Center in the early 2000s. She co-directed the center until her retirement just before the pandemic and has continued to teach at the UCLA School of Nursing and lectures widely on communication and ethics, nursing, and whole person care. In order to provide exemplary ethics education and support to nurses across the country, Catherine established a nonprofit organization, Ethics of Caring, which remains active today and only occasionally eats into her retirement as its president and uh, a continued educator. Since 2019, Catherine has lectured for audiences in Florida, both Dakotas, Pennsylvania twice, and Nebraska to name a few. We thought it was time she gave a talk a bit closer to what she and her husband now call home here in Portland. She has dozens of published articles and book chapters to her credit, ranging from the nursing literature to empirical ethics, palliative care to critical care medicine, and even co-authored a young ethicist's first article in the bioethics literature. Throughout her career, Catherine has been active in developing interdisciplinary programs on sustaining self-care, addressing moral distress, and promoting ethics education. She passionately believes that excellence in patient care can only be achieved in institutions where moral insight sensitivity and commitment flourish. So in addition to being a celebrated nursing ethics leader and a well-recognized clinical ethicist, Catherine is also a mentor to so many, including me. Speaking of, I know I'm not the only one here feeling not enough sometimes, that dreaded imposter syndrome, or not having enough to counter the headwinds blowing against us. And so, sometimes sans a word of hope, we find ourselves feeling like we're faking it, unaware that it is on the journey that we might find our voice, the virtues and integrity. Beckoning us along are the select rare few who have gone before and know the path. Catherine, I've come to learn, is one such soul. These mentors, if not prophets, show us the way so let me, after long last, invite up my dear Catherine. What can you say after an introduction like that? Thank you for being here today, those of you that are live. 
uh, alive. Uh, it truly helps when you're giving such a lecture to have a, an in-person audience. And thank you uh, for those of you that are with us virtually today as well. I would love to, at least with our audience here, I'd love to know who you are. So just kind of call out to me, what, what, what field are you in? What, what do you do? Ah, okay, okay. Anybody else different? Chaplain. Say it again. Chaplain. Chaplain. Thank you. Great. Internal medicine. Internal medicine. Great. Great. Pediatric surgery. Wonderful. And well, lots of residents. Fabulous. Good. So, um, when when Kevin. Uh, honored me with this invitation and I began to think about what are what are some of the important topics and how can we touch on uh, the legacy of uh, Alan Boyan and hope really struck me that uh, particularly during this time right it's it's the nuances of hope all these years of working with patients and families but now we have a new call for hope, uh, hope for ourselves, hope to be enough, hope to be able to continue despite the, uh, the, the resources that are so diminished and our own beings in some way so diminished by the last few years. So I hope that this lecture, hope, uh, will provide just a beginning of stimulus to rethink about hope and what it means in our lives and what it means for patients and families. So the brokering of hope, um, exploring the use of hope through the lens of beneficence and harm and discovering how the ethical use of language and carefully chosen words can bring healing in times of despair and describe how hope and meaning can be used as an antidote for clinician burnout. So that's some of what I hope to cover. So simple definition, a belief that something you want will happen. A belief that something you will want will happen. Okay, how many times have you hoped for something and it didn't happen? And it didn't happen. How many patients' journeys were you on where you just hoped mightily that your skills could make something happen, whether it was a cure or a peaceful death, and it didn't happen, right? And so what do we do with those times when it didn't happen? I want to start with a piece that some of you may know, William Carlos Williams, a poem because I think it, it brings us through the full journey of hope. By the road to the contagious hospital, under the surge of blue mottled clouds, driven from the Northeast, a cold wind, beyond the waste of broad muddy fields, brown with dried weeds, standing and fallen, patches, of standing water, the scattering of tree, tall trees. All along the road, the reddish purplish forked upstanding twiggy stuff of bushes and small trees with dead brown leaves under them, leaf, leafless vines, lifeless in appearance, sluggish dazed, spring approaches. They enter the new world naked, cold, uncertain of all, save that they enter. All about them, the cold, familiar wind. Now the grass, tomorrow the stiff curl of wild carrot leaf. One by one, objects are defined. It quickens, clarity, outline of leaf. But now the stark dignity of entrance, still, the profound change has come upon them. Rooted, they grip down and begin to awaken.
they grip down and begin to awaken. And in many ways, hope is the story of the desolate winter, the leafless trees, the skeletons, and then spring coming. Frankel, his quote, found hope in the distant lights of a small nearby village. The village could barely be seen in the daytime, but at night the lights glowed in darkness. Frankel imagined the village filled with normal people living normal lives, and it gave him hope. So in a dimension of utter despair in a concentration camp, simply seeing the light which of course has tremendous symbolic meaning, but it also represented life. Life beyond the horror that, and darkness that he was in. And it was enough to carry him forward and not just carry him forward in despair, but actually to come out the other side of such desolation with a hopeful life, a life well lived. And hope we know means also to cherish a desire with expectation of fulfillment, to long for, to expect. And in the archaic, it actually was related to trust, which I think is really important dimension for us that have done the caring work, that it's so closely linked to this idea of being able to trust you and you being able to trust your team around you and even the families and the patients themselves. Also the idea of agency. So both Plato and Aristotle viewed the link between hope and agency, right? And Aristotle, he didn't consider hope a virtue. He actually talked about the virtuous aspect of it was confidence or fear that led to the deliberation. Yet he viewed confidence and hope leading to deliberation for goodness. And that was the virtuous part of hope. So when we think of that idea of deliberation, right, it can occur in many times in life, but particularly during transitions. So John um, lost his name, McDonough, I believe it is, uh, talked about the threshold places in life, right? that we walk over a threshold and it came from the word thresher that separated the wheat from the chaff. So what was important in life? What was really to be valued? What was meaningful? And so these times of things, times of dying, right? Coming to terms with one's death or even chronic illness, the changes in one's life and body, finding meaning. Mental illness, one of the toughest, right? to find meaning in and to use that threshold of going in and out of wellness and well-being. Addiction, right? Think of hope as people have addiction, experience the despair of addiction, manage to come through it only to face it again. And stages in life, certainly giving birth, parenting, retirement, life events like grief and trauma, all of these are places where hope is especially needed, points of transition. And so I want to just approach this from care ethics as a kind of a container for hope and thinking about the questions of how care is given and received, relational both ways, power imbalances, right, that can occur in the, the provision of hope. And the relational piece, I think, is so important because sometimes we think we are the givers. But if we remember in a hopeful state that actually we are also receiving, especially from those patients that are, are, are themselves blossoming in whatever circumstances they are, they give us hope to carry on, to deepen our own wellspring our own sense of hope of what can be. 
And caring about is a dimension of care, to know what the needs are, in this case, hope. The patient and family has, um, and to acknowledge the need. So to actually speak to it, not to wait till the crisis, right? But to integrate it as a part of practice. And in order to do this, we must come to know the patient, their values, beliefs, their story, their history. And so, a story of an egg crate mattress. In my days of hospice care, home hospice care, I can remember going to a home where things were not great. The patient was beginning to deteriorate, but not imminently dying. Still, there was a lot of hope in that home and a lot of just, a, you walked in and there was a good feeling despite the hardness and the harshness. And of the circumstances. And so when I went and examined this woman, what I found was her skin was in deplorable condition and she was simply on a regular home mattress. And so I said that I wanted to order an egg crate mattress, a foam mattress to be delivered. And she became hysterical. She went from this peaceful state to this place of utter panic. And you could just see her, the color drain from her and this sense of, of literal panic. And so I said, tell me what I've done. And she said, you cannot bring that into my home. Why, right? I mean, it was such a demanding call to stop and listen to me. And it turned out that her beloved mother who had died only a few years before, that it was the entrance of the egg crate mattress that represented the soon to be death. So this is what I mean about knowing the story. Easily we can override people's stories, not knowing them, not asking, not being curious, but that is the hopeful piece that when we stop and we open the door to hear what the story is, we can begin to make sense of it. And we actually can then do good things that continue the hope for those individuals and the family and build trust. So the ethical obligation to provide hope, well, we need to be fostering it, right? and instilling it and promoting it and nurturing it and having confidence in it. But around this point, you may be saying, oh, but hold on, Catherine, have you not seen hope that gets us into trouble? We'll talk about that, right? But still, even with that, we need to recognize that hope should be part of our everyday practice because it has psychological benefits. It a, has a placebo effect. It lengthens progno uh, the prognosis often, and quality of life is clearly improved in people who have hope, focusing on the good and gratitude. Many, many aspects from the, the research that have shown that hope literally equals well-being. The psychological resource uh, for coping, so enhancing participation uh, in treatment. When, when, when one is hopeful about a treatment, then all of the bad side effects can kind of, I hear them, I've got informed consent, but I can put that aside and I can hope that I will be the one it doesn't happen to. And therefore I can engage and participate and, and welcome a treatment. It reminds me of guided imagery, the difference between someone going in for radiation treatment with, do you remember the, the crossbones and skull and, you know, just all those symbols that we use so nonchalantly. And yet those families that were walking in and those patients and seeing that, what does it symbolize? How can we change that? How can we change it to the radiation, the power of radiation? this wonderful gift that we've been given, that we actually harness essentially the sun, right? And magnify it and create light in the human being, in the darkness of the body to create healing, to create healing.
And even if there are side effects along the way, the body's great capacity to heal. When we speak that language to people, along with the informed consent, because informed consent is poetry and imagery as well. It's deadly though, it's terrifying, it's frightening. So we are called to do this balancing. It also helps with dealing with pain or loss of functioning, right? Perhaps you've lost the ability to walk, whether it's because of paralysis or because of weakness. What can you do? Reminds me of a nurse who came to a, a healing retreat, the circle of caring that I had the privilege of doing for 30 years. And she walked away from that retreat and she went to her patient's bedside, who she had been despairing about in the ICU, who was just, should have been getting better, but wasn't. The patient was a conductor. And she walked in the room that morning after the weekend retreat and she put music on that this patient loved. And she said to the patient who was not moving at all, let's conduct this together, show me how. And the woman raised her hands. And what happens when we raise our hands? Our rib cage expands and suddenly we take a deeper breath and we begin to move, movement forward out of being stuck. That's hope. Are we doing this in healthcare? No, we have our, I see a resident, right? Are you a resident? You just shook your head, no. No, you're not a resident. No, tell me who you are. A nurse, a nurse. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we're not doing this in healthcare because we have our nose to the grindstone, because we're, we're overwhelmed with the efficiency model of business because we are not reminded every day how to serve, but to serve joyfully, right? That's the hope. To aid in the process of redefining oneself, we know that that's what hope does. So even when circumstances are really tough, if we have hope, we can shift a bit and think about ourselves a little differently quality of life, so improved relationships with others, decreased sense of despair and depression, increased sense of self, even if I'm losing things, increased sense of self and feelings of control. Feelings, if I can hope, I can control a bit of this as things are falling apart. So what fosters hope? Well, interconnectedness with others is most often associated with hope. Conversely, isolation was a threat to hope. And this is um, from Nguyen's uh, The Wounded Healer, Nguyen. Um, so when we think about this, we know, we know from the sciences now how troubling it is when people are in isolation. It affects health, right? We know the studies that are showing loneliness, what that does to people. And so I would say that this is both important for you and your colleagues, you and your teams, you and your administrators, you and all the interplaying actions, but it's also important when we look at our patients, who are the most isolated? They are gonna need an extra immunization of connectedness in order to get to hope and wellness. Compassionate presence, the heart breaks to see suffering and grief. We all know this only too well. The ethical practice is to remain compassionate, to remain in relationship and remain present despite our pain in witnessing, while at the same time remaining clear and competent. Compassionate presence, that's what we're called to do. And sometimes what we do is we put up the barrier. We think, I cannot see this. I cannot take this. I'm done. I've seen enough. I'm used up. But if we can lower that and honor compassionate presence, that doesn't mean absorbing another's pain. It doesn't mean sucking in their pain and holding it within your soul or your body. It means finding ways 
to do that reflective process, to do literally body scanning as you're witnessing the suffering. How do I witness it and not hunch my shoulders, clench my teeth or knot my fist? How do I stay in that place of neutrality? I am witnessing and you see it in my eyes and you know that I am there with you. But I do not have to take your pain in physically and hold it. I can keep it out here. That's a radical shift in this being able to do this work in ways that you stay whole and welcoming, welcoming even of the suffering. And the nature of hope is really about resiliency and capacity to coexist with the suffering. And that is both for us and our patients and their families. This is a Paul Clay um, piece that he did this remarkable art. Um, and I, I was at his the museum in Switzerland. And prior to his death, he had a, a terrible chronic illness and his art changed pretty radically. So if you ever have a chance to look at um, his art in terms of the dimension of chronic illness, it's, it's pretty powerful, his art of the last few years. And the ambiguity of hope. So wandering hope brings help to many men, but others she tricks. Others she tricks. And so we, we know this is what I was speaking to, that there's hope and then there's hope that is not so helpful, that can actually be destructive. So hope is harm, false hope. We know this well, right? The, the patient who, even when you're doing informed consent, can only hear the hopeful. Even when you're informing of the, the future and what it may look like, disregards anything that you say and is like, I'm gonna beat it, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, without that wonderful balancing that we need for people to be able to make good decisions. Right. Hope that leads to inappropriate treatment, harmful treatment. Right. So those patients that are now, whether because of accident or disease, are at the end of their lives and not able to move into that place of coming to through the process to a peaceful place and and demanding that adamant kind of demanding you will do everything. And even when you use the language, we have done everything. Absolute denial. And hope that is brutalized, right? So we sometimes brutalize hope in trying to get people to move along, to get them to recognize their prognosis or where they are, or to get them to agree to treatment. We can go in and beat people over the head trying to take that hope away and we brutalize them. So finding ways to do it with gentle, compassionate presence and skill. So findings of early indicators and ethical conflicts. Um, this is research that I had done with my colleague, Carol Pavlish um, over the years, where we were really looking at beginning to understand what were the ethical issues? Were there early indicators that we could then actually essentially assess and score and then lead to how do we do this better? What interventions can we do that will help so we don't come to ethical conflict, right? We can come to ethical disagreement and discussion, but not the conflict. And so here we see that um, actually it surprised me that signs of unrealistic expectations was actually just around 9%. Um, but indications of patient suffering was 25%. So it's, it's an interesting piece because actually they are opposite each other. The signs of unrealistic expectations often lead to that suffering of the patient and uh, extending care that shouldn't be done. So the what some people call futile, non-beneficial, harmful care. Treatment, I should say. Let me correct myself there. Treatment, not care. Care is never harmful. So clinical trials and hope. Thomas LeBanc talks about 
what we hear can be colored by our hopes, dreams, and aspirations, which is not only true in relationships, but also in medicine, where cognitive distortions are common amid life-limiting illness, and where power and knowledge differentials between clinicians and patients can feel cavernous. And so the therapeutic misconception, maladaptive kind of hope, the unrealistic hope, high quality specialty palliative care can and should be provided along with clinical trial or any other active cancer treatment in patients with advanced disease. And that's what ASCO is now um, recommending. So this idea that even in a clinical trial where let's face it, we are dangling hope, if not hope for the individual, and most people are in clinical trials because it's that, that I'm hoping, even if it's altruistic, right? The hope of altruism, that palliative care can be introduced even then and create well-being and better decision-making. And what to hope for. So we know that hospitals are in the business of selling their treatments, their care, but also hope. And so this is a hospital in, in Jackson where quite shockingly, um, they began to deliver on a silver platter the idea that birth should be the most luxurious event you could imagine. And so they built their whole ad campaign around we will serve you on a silver platter, luxury. And of course, what happened, look at this, the visits to maternity um, landing page increased from 125 a week to more than 2,100. We can sell hope. The question is, what are we selling? And what are we hoping for? What do we get out of it in this business of healthcare? and what do patients get out of it. Downloads of uh, its amenities brochure rose from a handful to more than 327 per week and volume of births grew by more than 20%. So as we're in this competitive field of healthcare, is this ethical? Where should we not be helping patients to understand that what they should be hoping for is the best clinical care imaginable? Is that not the message and literally the mentoring that we should be doing with patients? So it's an interesting thought to think about hope and how it's used. The New York Times, this is a little dated, but still cancer center ads use emotion more than fact. Treatment marketing seems all the more troubling because it could offer false hope to ill patients. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, a co-author and an associate professor from Dartmouth. If you really wanted to give people real information, you would give them statistics, but that wouldn't be nearly as compelling. So we have to call into question, what are we selling? This is not to diss City of Hope. They are, their name alone makes them prone to selling hope. The miracle of science with soul reflects City of Hope's proven ability to create real medical miracles through a combination of leading edge science and patient focused care. We're now selling miracles, right? It gets us into trouble and I don't think it's where we wanna be. So brokering, Middle English, uh, negotiator from Anglo-French, brokeur, one who acts as an intermediary, one who sells or distributes something. So we see how a hospital can sell its product. But I'm asking you to think of yourselves as brokers of health, of um, hope in a different way. Eli Weisel says, I have learned two lessons in my life. First, there are no sufficient literary, psychological, or historical answers to human tragedy, only moral ones. Second, just as despair can come to one another only from other human beings, hope too can be given to one only by other human beings. I would add that I think spiritually, whatever you, your beliefs are, that I would add 
that perhaps there's a spiritual dimension to that, that we reach up and gather hope from God or the universe or nature or whatever, and then transcend that into and transform it to our patients. So the power dimensions, who gets to hold hope? So again, we come back to trust, history, right? So what can a black family hope for? Are they hoping for the best of care? Do they trust you given the history of healthcare in our country? How we have treated people of color? What does that mean in terms of hope? Am I hoping you just won't harm me? Am I hoping that in the uh, powerful book, Organ Thieves, that in the rush to transplant to be the, the institution that gets heart transplants out there in the world, in the marketplace, am I hoping that you won't steal my organ, my heart because I'm a black man? What can I hope for, given the inequities, the race issues, the gender issues, the religious issues, the gender issue? So there is a man who comes in for cardiac surgery, pretty risky. He and his wife have a long discussion before he goes into surgery. He says, look, I'm doing this. I'm going to Las Vegas. It's the lottery. But please, for God's sakes, if things don't go well, let me go. And things didn't go well. It was a disaster right from the start. The outcome was hideous. But of course, it's incredibly difficult as a surgeon to face that. And of course, there is hope that somehow, somehow, the miracle will happen. We'll get beyond this. There'll be some quality of life here. And so the conflict begins in this case between the surgeon who has all the hope and the wife who has the knowledge of what her husband wanted and the hope to actually represent him and his wishes. Who had the power there? Anybody guess? The surgeon, right? And so the surgeon began to say, essentially, she's just a woman. She's just the wife. What does she know? We shouldn't be listening to her. Maybe she has ulterior motives. All these questions that came up that were really about gender and power. And who was she to take his life away? Even though they had had conversations. So, and then of course, religious uh, traditions as well. Those values, core values that we all carry that then come into the play of whose hope, whose values, whose understanding. Oncologists, uh, again, this is very dated, but I think it, it's still true. Hope was found to be provided primarily through offering treatments and projecting future advances and potential treatments. And that makes sense. That's appropriate in a sense, right? As long as it is tempered, because in this situation, what, what it is is only hope for a cure, as opposed to the, the other hopes, that the hope that we buy time, not just for the next potential treatment, that can be part of the conversation, but we buy time for you to enjoy life. That we, that we do it in a way that yes, there'll be side effects, but that we don't crush you when we know we can't cure you, right? And not leaving other hopes behind. Choreographed hope. So this really requires responsiveness and attentiveness as a feedback loop. This is from Toronto's work. And I think, you know, that's so easy to say. And then I think about the environments that we've all worked in. 
now, 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 don't stop, don't reflect, don't think automatic, habituated behavior because we got to get from here to there, just like you get to work every morning. You go on autopilot and you just arrive. You don't even know how you did it unless like this morning you looked up and saw the beautiful snow in the trees. Did you miss it? Did you miss it? When you were driving, did you take it in? Did you store it up like the squirrel facing winter, knowing you were coming into this with all its demands? Did you take that beautiful filtering of snow that last night you may have been worried about, how the hell am I gonna get to work? And did you look at it and just go, oh, amazing. Responsiveness and attentiveness does not come naturally in efficient environments. You have to make it happen. Fulfilling hope versus understanding the patient's needs, concerns, and fears. You cannot fulfill hope with beneficence unless you really come to understand and know your patient. And you know, it doesn't take hours. That's the powerful piece to this. If you walk in and clear your agenda and you use the door as the threshold that you walk into that room and you are intentional and you say to yourself, I have time, I have time. I am going to show up here fully present. And in that space, the patient connects, the patient trusts, and the patient is willing then to engage in the dance. And when is hope addressed? Again, only in crisis? Is it dangled? Only in crisis. Is it dangled only at the beginning? Or is it used again with beneficence, right from the beginning, right to the end? Maladaptive kind of hope or unrealistic hope at the end of life, high quality specialty palliative care can and should be provided, right? So we talked about that and that in terms of decision making, right? Right from the start. So the many expressions of the dance, the clinician and patient, one-on-one, -on -one, right? How do we do that dance with each other? What happens when we stumble or trip over each other? Do we ask for forgiveness? Do we say we're sorry? Do we sometimes even admit, I don't have the words right now. I don't know what to do right now. I see you're hurting. I see your despair. I am here for you. Clinician team and family is a whole nother level of orchestrating and choreographing hope because you have more players. So you, let's just think about the ICU patient who is not doing well. And the more players that you have walking in that room with different perspectives and views about prognosis and uncertainty, the more complicated that dance is going to become. But if you choreograph it, which takes time, upfront time or downstream time, right? Which do you want? You're gonna spend it either way. But if you do it upfront and you orchestrate that team and you make the meeting happen before the meeting happens with the patient or family, there is hope that actually you will come across with the choreographed beautiful dance, which still may not work so well, by the way. You can be perfectly in rhythm and in tune as a team and go in and face a situation where no matter how many wet magic wands you had, you're gonna walk out with this sense, a little hopeless, right? but you still go back and do the dance again. And then institution and community, we're doing that dance all the time. We may not recognize it. Every patient that we take care of goes out into the community with a story and they do a, a dance in the community about trust, about horrors, right? About good care, about 
I didn't understand. I'm so angry. So that dance is always happening one on one with each individual patient or family as they leave us or with the institution in terms of the community itself, whether it's advertising or how insightful they're being about the needs of the community, not just profit, right? What does the community need from us and how can we broker it? How can we make that happen? Reminds me of um, gang violence where a hospital decided that it had to stop. The shootings had to stop. And what they began to do was literally broker at the bedside, bringing in gang members to talk about forgiveness, to talk about forgiveness, mentoring and role modeling. And the rate of shootings went down in that community. But we don't always think about that as healthcare, do we? But prevention, right? Again, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes creativity, it takes insight. But if we can get there, holy smokes, right? Then we're not doing all of that bloody work at the end that is so unfulfilling and unhopeful. So direction, when a man does not know what harbor he is making for, no wind is the right wind. So that's really, again, attentiveness. Knowing as you cross that threshold, why am I here? What is my goal? How can I be the healer that I signed up for a long time ago? That you may have even forgotten who you entered this vocation, how you entered this vocation, what your hopes were. So really being attentive to what is the harbor? What is the compass? Non-helpful um, things like doctor, this is from patients, doctor appearing to be nervous or uncomfortable, giving the prognosis to the family first, use, use of euphemisms, avoiding talking about the cancer and only discussing treatment, giving new, good news first and then bad news. So again, this is oncology, but I think it goes across everything, right? Um, helpful, being offered the most up-to-date treatment the obviously, right? The oncologist appearing to know all there is to know about the patient's cancer. Occasional use of humor, right? That makes sense because what does humor bring into the, the dance, right? Humanity. It brings you are a person and I am a person and we can laugh and joke together, even in the worst of times, appropriately. And being uh, told that the pain will be controlled and being told all treatment options, trust. Um, every time life asks us to give up a desire to change our direction or redefine our goals, every time we lose a friend, break a relationship or start a new plan, we are invited to widen our perspectives and to touch under the superficial weaves of our daily lives, deeper currents of hope. And if I were going to wish for anything for all of you today, those that are here with me and those out in the virtual, I would ask that you take those, the hardest of moments for you, those really trying dark moments, when you have an opportunity to ask yourself, what's under this? What is under this? What am I being called to do? How am I being called to respond? What are the possibilities? How can I be the creator of ways of doing this differently? And how can I maintain my hope for it? And so the solo dance of hope, it's really about awareness, balance, strength, endurance, and reassessment over and over and over, whether it's about hoping that you can stay in healthcare another year or five years or 10, or whether it's hoping with your patient or their family, or hoping just for well-being. The ethic of care allows the clinician to enter into suffering and affords the possibility of finding meaning and transformation, not only again for the patient, but for themselves. 
and hope for health care. While personal concern is sustained by a continuously growing faith in the value and meaning of life, the deepest motivation for leading our fellow human beings to the future is hope. And at this point in history, at this point in pandemic, and all that's been thrown at us in the last few years, I think that we need to be leaders of hope. And we need to be hopeful for healthcare, despite all that we've been through. We are at a point where the fire has gone through the forest and burnt it to the ground. And by the way, the forest wasn't so healthy before the pandemic. We should all remember that. But this is an opportunity in those burnt open fields now to see the green growth begin to come back. And the question is, how do we foster it? And what do we want it to be? And what don't we want it to be? Something bigger than ourselves, again, the spiritual dimension. Um, sometimes I go about with pity for myself and all the while great winds are carrying me across the sky. So remembering it's not just on your shoulders or in your hands that often we forget to just reach up like the conductor, expanding ourselves and saying, I need help, whether it's from you or you or spiritually, I need help in these dark moments. Finding meaning, and that's the essence ultimately at the end of every day. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And never stops at all. But we have to breathe life into it or it will falter and it will fail. I uh, will just take a moment also on that note to invite you um, to our virtual, again this year, Ethics of Caring Conference. Next year will be our 30th year. Uh, it's a national conference and um, I, here's the webpage and you are welcome to check it out. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started with um, uh, a comment uh, from the chat and then a question. And then uh, my task is to, if I don't see hands shooting up, to start calling on folks I know names of. And you probably know if I know your name, so get ready for a question. Um, so, you know, we have a comment here. Um, my favorite quote from Sister Karen Dufo, uh, hope is constant, but what we and our patients hope for changes. Her words are forefront in my day-to-day -day practice, and Sister Karen Dufo has a, a image for many of us of uh, how to embody um, those uh, virtues here at Providence. Uh, the question that uh, got a couple of upvotes here, um, as a bedside nurse, I often find that if a patient passes away, that I have failed in some way. Even when their death was inevitable or not preventable, it can still feel like a failure on the part of the medical team because our culture views death as having lost a battle. Do you have any suggestions for how I can reframe this in my own mind and have hope in those situations feeling those ways? Uh, well, one thing, the next lecture that I'm giving um, um, where I'll be using poetry does address this a little more, but I think again, the symbolism of battle, right? Just, just that alone, can we take that off the table? I think we'd be better off for patients and families. I think we'd be better off for ourselves. It's not about battle, it's about the given. That disease is, is the foundation, that, that suffering truthfully is a foundational part of life as much as we wanna cover our eyes when we hear that or our ears, right? So I think that that's the very first step that we begin to say, this is a house of healing. It's not a house of cure. This is a house of healing, which means no matter what the outcome, even a medical error, we have an opportunity for healing, even in death. 
These are transition moments, birth and death, and they are powerful, powerful times. But we ignore the power of them. We, we brush it off. We don't even acknowledge the sacredness of that time in our culture, in our healthcare culture. We don't understand that death, while it has its great sorrow and grief, has the incredible potentiality if we're shifting into the healing dimensions of it. And the question becomes, how do we do that? And how are we not doing it now? And then the last piece of that, I think, is how we dismiss what we do do. Every day as we leave, we, we list the things often in our head. Oh my God, I didn't do that. Or I, I should have followed up on that. Or I, I let that patient down. Or I, it goes on and on and on, right? The rumination of what I did not do, how I failed. How many of you leave, go through those doors, <laughs> let the trail of dust settle behind you and walk over the threshold and say to yourself, my God, what I did today what I did today, amazing grace. And you spend a good, well, you probably won't be able to do this quite honestly because you're, you're not practiced at it. You spend maybe a minute, I hope you'll get to at least 10 or 15 minutes, maybe even a half hour of recollecting all those moments in a given day, whether it was just smiling at somebody in the hallway, whether it was stopping and giving them your attention, whether it was actually, oh my gosh, like understanding someone and they got it and they knew it, let alone all the tasks that you did do. So I think that that's the beginning of the practice to begin to have gratitude for yourself and what it is that you are doing and the power of it. And if you get to the meaningful part and you stop saying, I don't have time for that and realize, upstream, downstream, I have time. I'm going to take time. And when I do that, it takes very little time because I'm going to meet you where you are. And things happen in those moments. And we get fulfilled and filled. Our wellspring deepens. And we stop looking at the failures, which we've been trained to do because that makes us better clinicians. Because if we think we have to be perfect, that we're going to work harder at being perfect. And God forbid, we're not perfect. That's all in that whole battle thing, right? What happens on the battlefield is horrific. How we find meaning in it and how we transform it. If we're in a trench and we reach across to our fellow colleague and we hold their hand for a moment or touch their shoulder or just make eye contact, we have made a difference in the world and we have not failed. We have not failed. And you're doing so much good every day that you are not even recognizing or crediting yourself with. One minute today, when you leave the building, let the trail behind you of the dust settle and you walk out into that air and you take a deep breath and you put your hand on your shoulder and you tell yourself what you've done today, the real stuff, the stuff that matters. How about a last question? Don't make me start calling out names. Or comments. Or comment, feedback, perspective. Well, I see a few residents in the back, and if you're at all like me, when I think back to my training, not in internal medicine, not in uh, as a clinician, but as an ethicist, I would often find times find a juxtaposition between heading up to have a goals of care conversation, joining a team on a really difficult case, and the gift shop, and seeing those sometimes militaristic metaphors about, uh, you know, curing at all costs. And I wonder for our trainees, how do you initially respond to this invitation to think about hope? I must admit, sometimes ethicists, I feel like my job is to squash uh, inappropriate, um, poor hope. 
Um, but how do you resonate with this notion of inviting hope into uh, the clinical environment? Still in my training, it was um, something that, as was discussed, the, the patients that you feel are you know, that um, the, the, the hope is inappropriate and you're wanting to squash it, but at the same time, you want it to be real. Sorry, so I was saying in my training, the these patients who their family and them have these hopes that um, are inappropriate and you want them as a human being to be true. Uh, you want them to pull through, but then you have that juxtaposition, as you mentioned, that you want to be the clinician for them. You want to tell them how it actually is, um, kind of speaking to those ads of the statistics and facts, and you don't want to give them false hope, but um, then the human side of you wants them to have that hope and trying to fight that is tough. Yeah, we're right at time, but uh, I think that interesting juxtaposition between the professional roles we put on and then those personal sort of inbuilt, the Victor Frankl, the Joan Tronto pieces of connecting with one another, that can sometimes be easier said than done. Catherine, do you have a last thought to respond to our chief resident with uh, this really insightful comment? Well, now I know why you're the chief resident. You spoke up. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think here's it, it is the dance, right? It's finding the ways. And so I can remember uh, I was working with a, a family one time and it, it was a child who was dying and they were they were not willing to even consider at that moment um, good care of the dying and power. they just couldn't get there. They were a very devout religious family. And so miracle was part of it. And I used the language, I used their language, essentially. I said, what would it be like to lift your son out of this bed and to place him on the altar of hope and ask for God's blessings upon him and then being willing to accept how God moves your son into life or into death, going home, going home, the two roads. What would it be like to bless your son with God's gift of infinite knowledge and wisdom, going home or going home? And they began to weep. I could weep now thinking of it. And in that moment, I choreographed not not some because of wisdom and knowledge and all that stuff, but I think we are also given this great ability if we open ourselves up and get out of the dialogue that we think is the right dialogue, right? And we think about who is this person? Who is this family? How do I use their language? How do I join them in this dance? That's when we do it well. And they made that child a no code after the, the weeping. I don't think anything else could have brought them to that moment. And I am only grateful in my language that God blessed me with the, that wisdom and those words in that moment. But again, we have to be attentive to do that. If we're on an agenda and a schedule and we got to get this done, I got to get this family, I got, right? It's not going to happen. If I cross the threshold, I always say a blessing before I cross these thresholds. When I was doing consulting, oh man, did I ask for a blessing of wisdom, right? If I cross the threshold with intention of doing good, almost always I will leave that room, even if it's still conflict and disagreement, with the other feeling respected, served, loved, honored. And that's the good outcome, even if we still end up having to provide non-beneficial harmful treatment until ethics gets involved or whatever else is involved. 
and ultimately maybe in our eyes we fail because we end up with a disastrous code and a person dying in a horrible way. Still, what happened in those moments is real and is carried generationally forever in the hearts and minds of those that we've been with. I don't know if that helps, but I, I hope I hope it does. Well, may we all take a word of hope with us and would you help me thank uh, Catherine for being our grand round speaker. And happy Valentine's Day. What a great day to do a lecture like this. Enjoy and be well. <laughs>